number 
Lord, it's divine. But most of all, there's sweet fellowship and praise and glory and honor going up to you. And we bless you for it. Father, we thank you for being able to serve you tonight in this way. We thank you for every one of this gathered tonight and those, especially Lord, who have traveled far. We pray that you'll bless them. And oh God, that you'll come down tonight and through these songs, you will speak to each and every one of us. Father, we pray tonight for those that have come into this meeting who are still outside of Christ, they've never trusted you. We pray even to the songs that are sang and to the testimony given that tonight, Lord, would be their special night when they find you as Saviour and as Lord. So, Lord, we just commit this meeting to you. We commit it into your care and into your hands. We pray that you'll bless it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
He has given the life of His only begotten for you and for me, so that our sins might be forgiven, so that we might go to be with Him in heaven. We did not, and we do not deserve such love. No matter how good we think we are, we fall short of God's standards. But yet, through the cross, He made a way for us to get back to Him, a way for our hearts and lives to be changed, a way for us to be made pure. The only way.
wants what he achieved on the cross to make a difference for you. He wants to fill a void in each of our lives to give us a peace, a joy, and an everlasting assurance that we will be with him. However, he does not call us to a stagnant faith, but rather to one which is ever-changing, ever-growing, bringing us closer to his perfect will. We cannot afford to sit back in our comfortable Christian lives, content with the knowledge that we are saved while others around us are perishing. We have no excuses. God can use us, no matter who or what we are, as long as we are willing to answer his call.
continually to seek to draw closer to God, so that the light of His power shining through us can guide others to Him. Our lives must be a signpost, giving directions to those who are lost.
fill the cup and down with its fair share of pain, trouble, and anguish. Sometimes our aims and ambitions can come undone, and we frequently are unable to comprehend why things unfold as they do. Although problems and difficulties may be set our lives, we must cling to Jesus, because he remains the one constant throughout it all. He alone is the anchor that will keep us steady in times of trouble, proving his faithfulness over and over again. He holds our lives in his hands. He knows our problems, and he will meet our needs if we only trust him.
despite the fact that the Christian life is not an easy one. The rewards in living it are great. By sharing with others and selflessly giving to them the love that he has given to us, we can feel the reward of drawing unto Christ. And of course, we have the assurance of the greatest gift, eternal life with Christ in heaven. A place where there will be no more suffering or pain. A place of ultimate beauty and wonder. A place free from the troubles and problems of this world. And just as we are called to serve Him, we should praise Him too. For what God has done for us is far more than we can ever repay. All we can offer is our lives, our worship, and our praise. And that is just what this teaching is all about. For He truly is wonderful. Everlasting, the Prince of Peace, the King of
Charlie, the big fan. And um, it's your turn again to say, I'm going to put the lights on just for a few moments. And the better the night comes at the start, and that was that on the 20th of September, okay, the church is having a missionary convention, a missionary weekend, and on the Saturday night, the 20th, there's a youth rally, and we want to invite you all, young especially, but all of us, feel free to come along as well, you're really feeling invited. Joseph Donnelly from down south in Dublin is the speaker. It's going to be a really big night, and um, the choir will be along and they'll be singing the night. So that's Saturday at 20th of September, 7.45 p.m. Thank you very much. That's saying a couple of, of courses. Let's have a favorite before we start. Number nine. Number nine. It is no secret for God to do.
was very sort of by the by. Let me just say that uh, at the end of the meeting there will be the opportunity of giving uh, towards the place fire. Uh, we don't want to send anything around, but there will be boxes um, at the door. There will be two at this door and there will be one at this door. And feel free to give. Folks, if you don't want to give, don't give. But if the Lord touches your heart tonight, you yeah, yeah. And we will appreciate it very much. Okay, let's sing. Where is it? Number two, all right. That wasn't good. Number two, okay. In moments like these.
not get better than that in the water pump. And we charge it 12 pounds in the water pump. So I'm glad the offer was taken off that I spoke. It is good to be with you today and it's good to be able to share with you a testimony. I was brought up on East Alphax uh, on the Witchcock Road. And I was brought up each Sunday to go to Sunday school. And I was sent each Sunday to Sunday school. Now I never arrived every Sunday. In actual fact, I never arrived at all. And my mother used to wonder why I always got consolation prizes when she had sent me every Sunday. But as life went on, I went to a great academic institution in East Belfast called Orange State Body School. I don't know what you're laughing at, but that one. Well, as I was in Orange State Body School, I started to get a reputation for being a, a bit of a, uh, my headmaster would call me a head of all. I don't know what he meant by that either. Well, I started to get a bit of a reputation about the school. Until one day a friend of mine came into the school and he said, Gerald, I became a Christian. Now, if the headmaster thought I was ahead of all, this guy was twice as bad. And he had now stated he became a Christian. Well, we looked at him and we said, well, we'll tell you what. We'll give you a week and we'll see how you last. So we give him a week. And after the week he seemed to be just as happy. So he said, well, we'll give you a fortnight. And then he came along and he said, Gerald, I want you to come along to a meeting with me. I'm going to give my testimony. Now, I didn't really know what a testimony was at that age. I thought a testimony was something that you gave when the policeman was beating you against the wall. <laughs> I thought that was a testimony. Or maybe that was just a witness statement. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll explain that. Right? <laughs> but as time went on, I said to him, no, I'm sorry, I, I can't go with you. There's a very important thing I've got to do on Wednesday night. And he said, well, what is it? Share with us. And he said, well, I, well, I said to him, I, I've got to watch a second part of a program. Now, I think he thought it was some very intellectual program that I wanted to, to see the second half of. But it was a program called The Swinging. <laughs> and I wanted to see who the real robbers were. And I said to him, I'm sorry, I can't go. I have to watch the second half of The Swinging. But on Wednesday, Trevor came in with this great big smile on his face. And he opened up the paper and he said, look. And he said it in such a gleeful way, look, that I knew I was in trouble. And I ran my finger down and the Sweeney had been put off because Mrs. Thatcher was having a political broadcast. <laughs> so because of Margaret Thatcher, I had to go to an issue. I'm sure she doesn't know. <laughs> but I went along and I went to the door of the little mission hall and I went in my normal car. I had my Dr. Martin boots on, half out my leg, my jeans just touching them, my white red Perry shirt on, my black jacket, my skin had hurt up near it, and my hard man look. Now it's hard to have a hard man look now when you have more chins than the Chinese telephone dragon. <laughs> so I'm not even trying to do it. But in those days I had a hard man look. But I arrived at the door, and at the door of the church there were these two men that I now know were deacons. They said demons, but they were deacons. And they were standing at the door shaking hands. And when I arrived at the door, they said, yes. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm here to go to the meeting. And I don't know whether all deacons are like this. I hope you're not, but I know you're a deacon. <laughs> I hope you're all not But the deacon turned around and said, now listen, if you come in here, you're not wrong with it all night. What's you going to say? And I found a few of those as life has traveled on. But they allowed me in and they sat me on the back row. And then, because they must have felt I was lonely, one of them kept, came and sat in that side of me. And one of them came and sat in that side of me. They keep me company and sure it was Christian and grace that brought them along. But that night, for the very, very first time, I heard at the age of 15 that Jesus loved me. And I heard not only did he love me, but he'd done something about it. That he went the whole way to Calvary, and he died on the cross for me. 
a skinhead who makes Belfast. Somebody who everybody else would give up on. One of my teachers said to me, you probably will end up in one of two places, John. Long Cash or Roselong. The choice is yours. Unfortunately, well, unfortunately, I didn't end up with it too. But that night, I was challenged about where I stood before God. And the preacher got up at me, he was a very little man. And he could just about see his head over the, over the lectern. And he said this, when Noah went into the ark, it was God that shut the door. And when the Lord Jesus comes back again, it won't be the Christians that say, you're not coming with us. It'll be God, because you will have had your chance to come and refuse. You know, I left the meeting that night, walking up the road back home, I started to think about how I really needed to become a Christian. But you know, all sorts of things go through your mind. And the first thing that was through my mind was, what would my friends say? And maybe you're here tonight, maybe that's part of your problem. You'd love to become a Christian, but you're afraid of what your friends would say. Well, as I walked up that road, I thought about the friends that I had. I was a side drummer in the Pride of Raven Flute Band. One of the best bands in the land. <laughs> I still is. I also boxed the Lindy Boys Club. And I was involved in a number of other things too. And I thought, how am I going to tell my friends that I became a Christian? And then there was another problem. I come from, well, I don't think it's that large a family. But some people think it's a large family. I have three brothers and four sisters. There was just the eight of us. <laughs> and my mum and dad were ten. So I can't work out how we lived in the two bedroom house, but we did it. But I remember thinking how I was going to tell my father. Because my father was a man who really had no time for church. Had no time for God. He was involved in the local paramilitaries. And at this stage he had He'd actually been caught on having a gun, and he'd been put into prison. And I was going to have to go and tell him that I became a Christian. But that made I realise that all of these things, all these excuses, weren't good enough. That all those people that I was thinking about, if I kept on thinking about them the way I was thinking about them, I was going to go to hell. And I realized that night I needed Jesus more than I needed my friends. And that night, in my home, I knelt down beside my bed, and I prayed a very simple prayer because I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know anything about theology. I knew this good thing was it. But I knew that Jesus loved me. And I knew he died for me. And I knew that he was willing to take me. That so many people had put on the scrap heap. Jesus was willing to take me. I went and I told my father. I remember going into the cubicle and there he was sitting behind this big glass screen and there was just this little circle in the middle for you to talk through. And I remember talking for about 20 minutes about everything under the sun. And then my mother, she said, Jack, tell me something to say about you. And she walked out. So I had to say it. And I remember telling my father I became a Christian and for some reason leaning back. <laughs> I don't know what he was going to do with this glass petition in between but all he said was, well, something that's what you want to do, that's fine. But then I had to start living as a Christian. Because I went to school the next day after becoming a Christian, and the first thing in through the door, somebody said, John, or you can run in the back to have a smoke. And we all learned how to smoke in those days. We smoked like that so the teachers couldn't see that we lit up it in the dark morning. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not going around. I'm a Christian. I became a Christian. And within about 10 minutes, it was a whole way around the school. And there were people actually coming up to the car door looking into the room <laughs> to see if it changed. If it not the halo on the wings or anything. <laughs> As you can see, the halo on the wings still haven't come. But my all round ministry has increased. <laughs> but I became a Christian at 15, left school as soon as I could, and became a meat technologist. That's a fancy name for a butcher. <laughs> I became a meat technologist and I served my time at the technology. And then I was asked, would I go and, and work part-time 
in a wee house in the state, doing children's work. And I went away and I prayed about it and I thought about it and I said, yes, I'll go. Where do you want me to go? And I said, Rath Cool. <laughs> so I came up to this wee housing estate in Rath Cool and worked out for about a year, trying to bring children to the Lord Jesus. But I realized that there was so much that I needed to learn. So I applied to the Irish Baptist Theological College. And they sent me this application out. And it said on the application, please fill in all your qualifications. Use a separate sheet if necessary. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't need the first sheet. <laughs> I didn't need the second sheet. But I did put down two qualifications that I had, and I sent it away. And I really started to look through the paper then, and I thought, well, there's no way the Baptist College is going to accept me with those. I got a telephone call to tell me that I'd been accepted into the Irish Baptist College, and they were all sitting there going, what qualifications did you have? <laughs> and I said, tell me you making black puddings and one million sausages. <laughs> now, if you want to the Baptist College, that's <laughs> one I said, tell me you black puddings and one million sausages, and you're in. So I trained there, and then I left there and I went over to Switzerland and trained with CEF, and then I come back. And I had the joy then of working in Clifton Park Avenue Baptist for two years as the assistant to the pastor. But then one of my dreams came true. You see, I always wanted to be a policeman. And I had applied 16 times. <laughs> And I kept on saying, no. <laughs> and I kept on saying, why? <laughs> and I kept on saying, your father's a very dick mom in the end. <laughs> 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 I was going, well, that's not me. <laughs> but you know, it's in my son. So by this stage, my father was gone. And I applied to the place. And I got in to be a British man. Now the very first day I went into the place, I got a nickname. See me, every place mom has a nickname. And there was a place man here tonight, tell me your nickname's there. <laughs> but mine was Pale Rider. Now I didn't know what this was for. But Pale Rider was a Clint Eastwood film. And he's a pistol packing pastor. <laughs> and that was my, that was my nickname the whole way through the force. I served my, of course I served my time, but <laughs> I served first of all on the Armour Road and was involved in the massacre that happened in the Armour Road in the British shop. So they transferred me, and they transferred me into a riot squad. I don't know why a wee delegate thing they made was ever transferred into a riot squad. But long I went anyway into an MSU, and then things started to go wrong. For some reason, Terrorists took a dislike to me personally. And they tried to blow me up outside my home. And it didn't work. They tried to shoot me. And that didn't work. Because the guy who was trying to shoot me, I shot him. <laughs> and killed him. And I ended up, at that particular time, coming home with a lot of stress and a lot of strain. So the police authorities said, they'll tell you what we'll do, we'll move you to a place where nothing ever happened. So they moved me to Lillohanna. And one night we went to a pub disturbance and we went to the Great State Massacre. So by this stage, I wasn't feeling good. And suffered from a thing called post-traumatic stress. But through it all, friends, and let me share this with you, and this is the reason I tell you this tonight, it's not to glorify me. But it's to glorify the God that I have. Because he never left me. In all those times when I was sitting on my own, in all those times when I was going through these thoughts about taking somebody's life, God was there with me. And he was saying, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. That's the friend that we recommend to you tonight. That's the saviour that we want you to have tonight. One who is with you when your door is shut and you're on your own. One who's there to encourage, one who's there to lift you up. The night of the shooting incident, I arrived down to the police station. And I arrived and there was a policeman leaning over the counter. 
And I said to him, can I see the sergeant play? Do you need to see a sergeant? Would I not do? I said, no, we really need to see a sergeant. Are you sure? I said, well, yes I am. Can you not tell me what's wrong? I said, well, okay, I'll just tell something. Hold on. <laughs> what did you do until the sergeant thought it come in? And the sergeant was from the Baptist church in Bangor. And he said this to me, he said, remember this, Joe, the Lord protects your coming in and your going in. So then they sent me up to the inspector, who was a brother-in-law from the Lord. And he said to me, Joe, remember this, God protects you going out and you're coming in. And then he sent the chief inspector, who was a Baptist from Bangor. And he said, Joe, remember this. God protects you going out and you're coming in. Then I sent the superintendent. He was a congregationist. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you have all the top men in here. <laughs> and he said the same thing. He said, Joe, remember this. You're going in and you're coming out is protected by the Lord. You see, tonight, we bring to you a Savior who is not just what's in the good time who is not just with you on a beautiful evening like this, when we have a tremendous choir singing to us. He's with us all the time. No bad time. No sad time. That's the Savior that we recommend tonight. And maybe you're here tonight and you're not a Christian. You've never asked the Lord Jesus to come into your life. You've never asked the Lord Jesus to make that difference. Try and recommend them to you tonight. There's a form in the place and it was never used on me because it's to recommend you for a senior coach. <laughs> and the chief constable and I had something in common when we were in the place. None of the two of us were going any higher. <laughs> <laughs> but there is one form in the place. And on the very bottom line it says this, I can recommend this man wholeheartedly. You know, I can recommend the Lord Jesus wholeheartedly to me. Because he's not just there when we're all you know, when you get into a prayer service, it's great. But then you go home tonight. And you get up on Monday morning. And you go through the same routine all the way. But we have a God, the Lord Jesus, who is with us on Monday morning. You know, some of you may think here today, you'll become a Christian when you're older. <coughs> I found after three attempts on my life that I'm not sure. How old I am? I'm 34 now. I know I look a lot older. I had a very hard time running. <laughs> I'm 34 years of age, and already there have been three times when I could have been out of town. But please God, I was ready. What about you? <coughs> Would you be ready? You know, we can know all about the Lord Jesus. We can know all that He's done for us. But have we ever done anything about it? Before they let me into the place, they came along one day and they said, Gerald, we have a problem. And I said, just go on. He said, yes, we have a problem. You're too fat. <coughs> and I said, what? <coughs> now, by this stage, I had grown to the, I was about 17 and a half stone. I was a point of a light about the traffic on it. <laughs> <laughs> but they said, hey, we want you to be 13 stone. And I said, well, gee, that's, not, that's not much to ask. That's only four and a half stone now. <laughs> Give us a week. <laughs> well, it's saying that we need to do something about this weight loss. So I started on the diet. I had to stop the diet. I was she eating the diet and the normal food. <laughs> what I had to do was I had to start cutting down. But you want to be the sort of person who eat an awful lot of things. When I go home at night, and do you know those day and this? Well, once you open one of them, you go to your day, and you go all strong, yeah. And that week the most time. When I used to come out at night, and that evening when I was out, somebody would have said, John, you haven't even gone with your day, no more of that. And then went home and got the day and that. <laughs> but I looked up every day and see how, how many calories there were in that one. And how many calories there were in the car? There were them in there, but just look it up. And I had a hand knowledge of all that she was doing. I should be out running. 
I've been in exercise. I shouldn't make them bad habits before we're I mean, I've actually worked out how to be really thin. I mean, what's your brother been at the end of his name? And my son was on the basis where he took off. <laughs> um, I think really if I was ensuring this church, I would ensure that slowly. But I would have more of it. That's young over the school, isn't it? So that's how you lose weight and get rid of them. And you're losing all the time. But I knew all about losing weight. But I hadn't been learning about it. And it wasn't until one day mother said, Mate, oh. You realize uh, you haven't lost any weight, and you're going to be interviewed in a couple of months, and they're going to wind you. And I said, oh, sure, I'll get it off, don't worry about it. And she said, John, you've got to do something about it. And I said, look, in an apple, there's so many calories. And she says, oh, it's fine, you're still going to have to do something about it. And it wasn't until I said, right, I'm going to have to do something about this, I cut out the main edit, and I stopped. Need the leg alarm taken off the neck. Put <laughs> <laughs> all those things away. And I started to eat proper food. I actually lost the four stone. And they let me in at 13 and a half. And there was a man here, you know, not me, but he had to, uh, had to take my trousers out a wee bit. He let me in. And then he had to get me a special hat. Because singing had the biggest head in the RUC. <laughs> and uh, when, when I actually handed it back in again, it's actually the new roundabout now. <laughs> you know? But I knew all about that. But I didn't lose any weight until I did something about it. And you can know all about the Lord Jesus tonight. You can know that the Lord Jesus loves you, that he died for you, that he wants you to come and accept him and let him come into your life. But unless you've done something about it, all that knowledge could go with you to a lost eternity. It's no good just knowing. You've got to believe. Two years ago, or just a year and a half ago, they medically retired me from the case. I'm a pensioner. <laughs> I'm a in it somewhere. But I'm a pensioner. But I now serve the Lord as an evangelist among the police. Because there's nearly 14,000 police officers. And we need to tell them about the Lord Jesus. But tonight, we need to tell you about the Lord Jesus. Why put it off? It could come a time when it could just be too late. I was speaking to a young fellow two weeks ago who was one of my Sunday school class. It was interesting when we heard the song tonight about the Sunday school teacher. And two weeks ago he told me that he was thinking of starting Bible college. Probably one years of age. <coughs> I went today to see him in Brown's funeral parlor. He was killed in a motor accident and they probably going to know the other day. And he lies in that Brown's to be buried in Monday. But for him it's different. For him death isn't a tragedy, it's a triumph. Because he knows where he's going. And he was lying down there, the remains were in that coffin today, and I knew he was absent from the body, but praise God he was present with the Lord. What if that was you? Where would you be? Absent from the body, present with the Lord, <coughs> cast into eternity. No matter how good you think you are, no matter how good you are. If you could get to heaven your way, there was no need for Jesus to die. But he died for you. <coughs> what are you going to do with the Lord Jesus? <laughs>
time when our right to pray and worship will be stripped away from us. I just hope that you are never put in a position where you have to choose between your faith and your life. But if someday you are forced to choose, I know what you choose, what choice you'll make. Because I know that Jesus lives in you.
I'm sure it's not you know it. I know I'm up in there, you know, just then saying it. So we want to ask you to stand with us and sing this with us. And then I'm going to ask, isn't it the Lewis here? Yeah. Can you come up and pronounce the, the benediction and, and say thanks for the food? So we like to stand with us and we'll sing together. <laughs>